How many of you are familiar or have heard of Fresh Desk before? All right, we got some, some hands coming up here. Fresh Desk is one of those companies that helps you provide better service to your customers, to reach them in the channel that you need to reach them in, and to make it more efficient for you to do that. So I am pleased to have our title sponsor, uh, uh, Dilawar Syed from Fresh Desk. He's the president of Fresh Desk. And uh, Dilawar, um, you guys have raised $94 million or so over a couple of years. You've been out since 2010. You have over 50,000 customers from big to small. They're spread out all over the world. So you have some really interesting insights as to you know, the importance of having a service-first culture and how mobile plays into that. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. But maybe you can even fill in even more blanks about Fresh Desk and what you guys do. Got it. Thanks, uh, Brett, for having us here. And uh, it's great to see uh, you guys in Atlanta. Uh, before we talk about um, you know, service and, and the business, uh, I do want to share a story a little bit. Uh, but just to get a sense of who's in the room, I saw Paul, our friend, uh, raising hand. They know Fresh Desk. The rest of you hopefully would know by the end of this conversation. But I do want to get a sense of who is in the room. How many of you are entrepreneurs or small business owners? If you could please raise your hands. Okay, that's great. And how many of you are industry professionals, people like us? Um, so good, good mix. And you know what I think our story is is frankly a story that is being repeated all across this country as well as around the world uh, with tech-enabled businesses that can quickly become global phenomena. And in some ways, you know, it proves the point that if you have a good idea, that you're committed to it, you have a great team, you can execute, you can do this from anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be Silicon Valley. We've been very, very grateful to have great partners in Gold Capital, Tiger, and Excel, and raise a bunch of money, but that happened because um, there was a strong passion around solving a business need, um, and the team has executed beautifully. So the company was founded, as you alluded to, about five years ago, uh, actually in India. And from day one, it became a, a global player. In fact, our very first customer was in Australia. Uh, what we responded to was this uh, phenomenon, I think that many of us as consumers um, are uh, experiencing it. And that is that in the world of mobile and social, all of us feel increasingly empowered to share our sentiment about brands, to talk about stuff that doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, but, and if you have an issue with an airline, you tweet about it. If you don't like uh, a service of your restaurant, you know, you would go on Yelp and, and make a review. Um, so every organization in the world, almost anywhere, regardless of their size, has to worry about their reputation and their brand and respond to service from the very get-go, not wait till they get a big, become a big company. So we came into a world, um, and, and I, by the way, grew up in industry at Siebel. That's where we started working with Paul uh, as a part manager. And the Siebel's of the world, if you will, and Salesforce and the other folks who are peers in the industry, you know, they have been um, more focused on the larger companies and helping manage their reputation. But I think what, where we have come in is to help democratize the same enterprise-grade tool, but for companies of all sizes, whether it's small, medium business, uh, entrepreneurs, fast-growth startups, in the, uh, um, uh, um, universities, uh, we are at GSU, a lot of our customers are actually uh, academic universities. So after five years, we have uh, grown to actually more than 50,000 customers globally. And just to give you a sense of scale, we have gone uh, from about 10,000 customers about two years ago to now 50,000, a five-fold increase. And again, a lot of SMBs and now increasingly some big companies. We, we've about 600 people strong globally, headquartered in San Francisco Bay Area, large gym in India, and now UK, Berlin, and Australia. You have a wide perspective on uh, what companies are doing from a service perspective, big and small, international. Just off the top of my head, what are some of the, the important trends or the important things you're seeing customers do in terms of this idea of service first? Are the majority of these companies a service first company or are they still trying to figure it out? Well, I think if you are operating in this economy and especially and regardless again of your size, um, you, 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 again, you have to respond to customers from the very get-go. Um, actually, let me ask folks here in the audience, how many of you have ever tweeted about a poor service experience? I know, Alan, you would, <laughs> but the rest have also been doing it. Um, 
And, 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 and let me actually, you know, and, and so that happens. And how many of you have actually filled a Yelp review you, on a restaurant? You, you have. So, so write a book review. Or, or yeah, or yeah. So, so you have to respond. And I think, again, you have a, a customer base that is, and you're also on, on the go. You're mobile, right? So you, you don't have to wait till you get somewhere. So you're, you're sharing what you're feeding. And that creates an environment. And by the way, you expect then from the other side that the customers will respond to you. You know, we read the surveys all the time from industry and from analysts that a lot of companies uh, don't get back to customers on Twitter uh, until like hours later or days later. There is no, they, they still are not responding at the, at the pace, at the speed at which the consumers are, are, are expecting it. And by the way, that phenomena is even more so uh, in emerging markets, in, in markets outside North, North America and Western Europe because a lot of consumers there, their first digital experience is on the mobile device. Folks are expecting to be responded on WeChat, on, on WhatsApp, um, on Facebook Messenger. So it's, it's changed the world in a very big way. And what you have is tools that were built in the 90s that were built for a very different era. And now we are in a place where you want short form communication, interactivity, uh, response back on the mobile, um, you know, at the very heartbeat in which you are, you are reaching out to the customers. So there seems to be a rush be uh, to get to be a mobile first company because we all know that people live out of the palm of their hands right now. A lot of their attention is, is basically looking like this. Do you feel like the companies are rushing to the, this mobile first without having the, the, the structure, the culture, the organization from a service perspective to make sure that they're going to meet the expectations when, com when their customer goes to look at their palm of their hand? That's a great point. Um, you know, often folks say, how do you, uh, and you asked the question earlier to me, was how do you make a service-oriented culture? Well, first, it starts with the culture. You can't just say, just because I'm going to go and make sure we, I'm ready to respond to folks uh, as they come into me on the mobile device um, and I'll deploy a tool. If you don't have a culture that fully internalizes uh, the, the, the ethos of, of service, it's not going to work. Because maybe you have hired people, maybe you have built-in processes, you have built-in structures that are designed to respond, not in an interactive manner. That, that, that have people who haven't been trained on responding to tweets in 140 characters. There are people who haven't been trained on having a conversation via live chat. It, so it literally requires, not to scare folks, it requires a, a, a brand new paradigm of how do you build up an organization, how do you build a culture, how do you bring folks who can actually respond in this multi-channel manner to a very different consumer in the year 2016? Um, so that's number one. So you do have to kind of re take a look at this and how do you redo it? And we've seen companies bringing in a new customer experience, uh, C-level exec. Um, and that has happened, by the way, at even big brands. Uh, but also it's happening at smaller, uh, in smaller companies. You've seen companies um, that have you know, retrained their employees. And I'll also make another point about the customer service reps who are using, uh, let's say, our software today, or for that matter, Zoho's or others, uh, a lot of these folks are uh, millennials. They have grown up, they're digital natives. So when they come to workforce, and they're supposed to spend 10 hours or 12 hours responding to customer service questions um, and slogging away, uh, they, they want an experience of software that is near consumer apps that they, are, that they grew up on, Snapchat and Facebook. Do you think today's uh, customer support software at workplace uh, is even close to uh, that consumer experience? I can answer for on all of our behalf. behalf. Answer is no. It's clunky. It's designed for 20 years ago. I mean, even I don't find Salesforce intuitive, with all due respect, and we use it for our own CRM. And you have to customize stuff. You have to really have people train you. Th that world is gone. You're supposed to come in. You know, you're hired. You 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 have the thousands of queries coming in at you. You put your live help desk on, and people need to be able to go in without training, quickly connecting with your consumers who are knocking at your door from any channel, any device, from anywhere in the world. So the software today that we have inherited over the last 20 years, it's it just not designed for that. It's not designed with a consumer experience. And that's where the next-gen cloud-based companies like ours are trying to change the model and say, make sure we are ready for the million workforce, not just in this country, not just in Western Europe, but around the world. So to answer your question, yes, you have to you know, make sure your culture is service first. Um, make sure your organization is ready for that. Make sure you have the right people, but also you have the right tools that these folks can actually 
use, uh, you know, and, and the adoption is there. I'll give you examples. So we've had some customers where they're using, and I won't name names, um, some clunky uh, legacy software, and some of the even cloud-based software, that, that frankly had almost zero adoption. They spent millions of dollars customizing it with the help of big-name SI firms, uh, many of places that many of us have worked and or, or interacted with in the past. Uh, so just because you have a license enterprise-wide and you have a market presence so-called and you end up nicely on a magic quadrant doesn't mean you're adopted well. Uh, when you go inside and you see that you have now 60,000 employees of a major consumer packaged goods company in the world and most of them are millennials and they don't use it um, and they actually go and sign up online with a tool like Freshdesk, you've got some thinking to do internally as a CIO as a company and say, well, let's make sure not only we, we, we are giving them the tools that they are they can use easily, but also are not wasting you know, our hard-earned dollars of the company. And I think that's where you see companies like Bosk, Box, Dropbox, Freshdesk, Constant Contact. We are changing the game by entering the enterprises um, you know, with a departmental level, team level, or Slack for that matter, um, you know, strategy, and then disrupting. And often it's proliferating across the organization without even sometimes you know, frankly, having a big IT uh, contract in place. So it, it's a new world. It's an exciting world. Um, by the way, it also means that we, we have to have our feet on fire because our products have to work seamlessly for a larger audience, for a, for a smaller company. And while it's simple in its use and setup, it cannot still a, a com uh, uh, a compromise on the complexity of the enterprise processes. Just because it's simple and easy to use doesn't mean that you can't help a, a, a complex business process. Uh, and of course, I come from, a, from that world. I worked at Siebel and SAP back in the day, so I appreciate what that means. But at the same time, those experiences are no longer relevant in, uh, in uh, today's world. So let's talk about customers are driving a lot of changes. The, the way that they want to interact with the company, they're, they're driving it. A lot of that comes through marketing, and a lot of it comes through service. How is the relationship of the service folks and the marketing folks changing because of what's taking place with customers and technologies and the way they're adopting it. So, you know, I think customer support is the new marketing. And I'll say it again, customer support is the new marketing, especially in the world of mobile. A, a customer doesn't care when I reach out to an airline or on my device or we all reach out to, um, let's say, Uber. Um, you, you, you're, not, you're not saying, oh, well, you know, I'm talking to a customer service rep. Uh, well, you have questions. In fact, you're, you expect and by the way, uh, a demography that's a y younger from, let's say, my peer age group would, would expect even more so that I should be able to have any conversation about their brand, about the service, but also about the product. Maybe they can offer me a promotion. Because in mobile, you're on the go. The brands, you know, you, they know where you are. They can target you in certain ways. Um, so, so the lines have blurred quickly. And again, our organizations on the on the enterprise side are not ready yet. You know, we still have silos of service and, uh, and marketing and, and sales. But in a, in, a, in a mobile world, when I'm reaching out to somebody from my device, from within an app, that, those walls must come down. And, um, and there are examples where some companies are doing a pretty good job that when you engage with them, not only they respond to your question, but they also say, hey, by the way, we understand that you were in the middle of this um, you know, transaction on our website, but here's, here's a store you are, that's close to you where you can go and complete the transaction. Well, you expect that to happen in retail and e-commerce. Um, you know, by the way, just uh, one uh, example that I have which is interesting is, I'm sure everybody here has used Uber or, 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 or have interacted. Has, has anyone ever used Uber support on the device? You have. And uh, the rest of you have not, but let me sort of describe for you what happens, and I'll use that point to illustrate that even in the case of mobile companies built for the mobile uh, devices and mobile world, we still have to go so far. So what happens with Uber is that let's say you, 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 you take a trip, and your driver, actually you, you, you book a trip, but your driver doesn't show up, but you get a charge. Um, you know, you reach out and say, hey, by the way, uh, I shouldn't be, I should have not been charged because the driver never showed up. So you go to the Uber app and you click on support and it immediately takes you to your last transaction because most, uh, most uh, uh, you know, transactional shared economy mobile devices, they know the last transaction is where you'll have the most questions that they put that in front of you. However, once you click on that, it takes you to a static page of um, text within the app and tells you to send a, 
you that write, that you should write a little message there, and then we'll email you, and we'll resolve that issue for you via an email device. So we, we are the email medium. And then you get an email within a few minutes and say, hey, by the way, we got your inquiry, you, we, we got your complaint, we'll take care of you. However, let me ask you, do you expect that, that from Uber, which is actually an app, mobile app, the whole business is the mobile app, that you should be having, uh, that you should not be resolving your support issue um, within the app? At least I think I would like to believe yes, most of us would it. like for us to resolve it within the app. But even in case of Uber, just to illustrate the point of how far we are as an industry, the consumer expectations are that if I have an issue with Uber support, I should be able to have a messaging, I should be able to have a chat within the Uber app and say, you know what, take care of it. And they say, oh sure, we took care of it. By the way, here is a coupon for you for your next device. And we know that you may be going somewhere because you take this trip all the time, at this time every week. Um, and technology offers you that capability today. But we are very far as an industry, even in the valley, in the heart of the valley. And Uber is a well-capitalized company, multi-billion dollar in, in market cap. Um, so that's the chasm, if you will, between what you and I as consumers, uh, you know, and I see here in Atlanta, I mean, it's, it was just wonderful to see so many you know, uh, moms were driving Uber, they're part-time drivers. I mean, it's changed the economy. It's, it's totally changed the, the way we are uh, earning that next income, the second income. But the, 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 the technology on the other side um, is also ready. However, companies are not responding uh, with an effective means to uh, uh, enable what you expect as a consumer. So as an example, and I'm gonna just for the first time do a little plug for one of our products. Uh, we, we launched a product called Hotline recently, which is a mobile engagement platform. What it does is it, it allows you to have a messaging within the mobile app with the, with the customer. Um, so if I'm in Uber, and if I have an issue with the driver or with the charge, I go into the, that support page, and I can actually go back and forth without having to wait for an email to come later on and then saying thank you via an email. That's old school. That's not what the shared economy is built for, period. And by the way, the same experience can be, can be applied in e-commerce and in other places. Um, and, and I know Amazon is, is, is making quite, quite a bit of strides there, but, but it doesn't have to be just Amazon. I mean, almost any app on the mobile device, you have to go into that world. So that's what we're talking about, Brent. We're talking about a world where I think it's already happening. Uh, you know, in the near, very near future, we're gonna be experiencing our, our shopping experiences, our academic experiences, our tra travel, transportation, all via the mobile devices, all with, via the apps. And we would expect to have a, a seamless communication with brands about service, but also expect that they will uh, help me with my shopping um, um, you know, experience. They will help me with perhaps pointing me to, me to a better offer or, or sharing with me some content that can help me make a, a more informed purchase, all within that same conversation. I don't care whether I'm talking to a customer support professional or whether I, I should be talking to somebody on the sales side. And that's where, as an organization, as businesses, we have to mesh those, um, those silos um, you know, yesterday. Yeah, otherwise, we are not going to scale. For, for startups that are starting out, how important is them to have their service model at the heart of the business model in order for them to be successful, to ramp up quickly, and to reach the customer and reach the customer expectations right out of the gate. So, you know, we have some examples in the Valley and, the, you know, you obviously get in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, folks who are starting out and quickly they'll uh, see some traction business. We know that customer support reps are often the very first set of people they hire. You don't wait till you have customer because, again, nobody's ready whether or not uh, you're ready. <laughs> you know, folks are going to come at you. Um, and by the way, in a business like ours, and many of you, if you're launching a business on the web, that traction can take place pretty quickly uh, because many a times you're using you know, uh, Google as an online acquisition channel. You know, you, you, you're, 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 in, you're, you're in front of the world. So um, it, it depends where you are, but like, for example, e-commerce uh, in terms of B2C world, you would think about your customer support uh, uh, organization, think about you know, the, the, the people you want to hire, uh, initially, it might be a couple of people, let's say, depending on where you are, but you want to think about um, scaling that pretty quickly. I mean, we saw just in our business, the overall ticket volume um, doubled, if not tripled, year over year. I mean, as the number of customers went up, the, the number of tickets, the number of conversations 
um, actually was uh, order of magnitude even faster uh, in growth. Uh, because you are increasingly serving more complex customers, the queries become more complex. They also come through any channels, right? And you have to be ready. So I would, I would, I would give that thought from the very earlier on. I, and also, I would encourage all of you, any one of you is a CEO in the room, whether it's a smaller company, a medium company, or is an entrepreneur, uh, you are the chief customer support officer. You know, at the end of the day, taking care of a customer, especially the, that first early customers, is what's going to establish your reputation. And we have a great culture in our organization that our CEO spends time on support. We all, I have access to Twitter uh, for a fresh task, and I have personally responded much to the chagrin of some of my team members and say, hey, I'll, we'll, we'll respond to you, we'll, we'll take care of you. Because again, consumers are expecting that from you. And, and also, when you do that, when you put yourself in that line, you really know what's going on. Uh, you know, you can't leave it off to your, um, uh, you know, a, a department or some young professions you have hired. I mean, they often me. This might be their first job. Um, so, so you have to pay attention to it. So, yes, of course, hiring, uh, having the right tool in place very quickly. And by the way, with tools. Speaking of the tools, since you're talking about technology here as well, the good news with tools like Freshdesk, and, fa and for that matter, even our peers in the market is that you don't have to rip and replace anything. You can trial these things for 30 days without even paying anything. You can see how it works. And many a times, like in our case, we'll get on the phone, we'll help you set up your help desk within a matter of days. And if it works for you, great. If it doesn't work for you, you can you know, try something else. So you know, gone are the days where you would contract with, an, with a small consulting firm. You will do an evaluation of three vendors, and you will bring them on, and you'll customize and spend six months. Now, nowadays, you know, whether it's your a customer support tool, your, your for that matter, CRM tool. You can you can you can try them very quickly. Put them you know in your in in, in motion even as you're launching your business. Um, in an average, a number of um, SaaS vendors that a small startup uses is about six to seven in their very first three months. They have one system for their support, one for CRM, one for you know email management, for marketing. And, and many of these businesses that you have built, the model is that you can trial. So it, it, should not be, um, it should not be a big hurdle to cross if some, some, something doesn't work, because you know, that's, that flexibility affords startups to very quickly put that technology infrastructure in the cloud in place for you. I'm going to ask another question, but I want to get some questions from the folks out there uh, in a minute. So when it comes to meeting the expectations, uh, how is that changing? the way that your customers are measuring success in, in servicing their customers. Are metrics changing? Are they, are they not as uh, uh, using something like, how much time are you spending on this call? Or are you seeing a different kind of metric or a different way that they're judging a metric today? That's a great question. And I know if Brand, I can uh, do justice to that. I mean, fully, uh, we know metrics like first call resolution, right? Those we all grew up around them, though they, they still matter. But it, it, did you really satisfy the customer <laughs> in that first call resolution? It, it's a very efficiency-driven uh, metric. Uh, it's not necessarily a um, uh, sentiment-driven metric, right? And again, going back to the fact that we are in a world of sentiment now, which can be expressed anywhere, anytime, through any device, by anybody in the world. You have to pay attention to it. So I, I don't think, I, I personally don't believe there is a playbook for like five metrics that all organizations must adopt because it depends. It depends. And you know, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you know exactly where the pain is, where the delight is for your customers. So you want to measure not just the first call resolution or the first you know, inquiry resolution, but rather you know, how happy people were. So surveys do matter, right? Pe you know, some sort of free form communication with the customers do matter. Um, and, and there are ways to, to build that. You can also benchmark yourself using SPS with your NPS, using your peers in the industry and see how you are tracking. Um, and so again, I, I, I would just caution to not just use metrics that are designed for internal efficiencies, mostly cost-driven, frankly, and this is the world of the 90s. <laughs> but I would, uh, I would uh, think about metrics that are more driven from sentiment and customer happiness and delight because the, the customer sentiment is infectious in this, in this world. And, and good or bad, it will, it will go down. You know, my favorite example is I, a, a couple of years ago, somebody had a bad experience with British Airways, and this individual actually tweeted it, not just did that, but actually promoted his tweet. 
he was so mad that he 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 spent some money on Twitter and he actually put it on on the web and it just took off like crazy and he was pretty colorful in his language um, and, and so that's the world you're in I mean I mean it's 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 and it happens you know a lot uh, sometimes we have done that too uh, in in some ways so uh, that's my sort of high level response to it is a sort of different frame around metrics mm -hmm. any questions out there I want to do my uh, my walk around and come down and you know do like the talk show host thing so does anybody have a question I'm gonna Oh, I, anybody, anybody, any takers, any takers? Because I got other questions I can ask, you know. So. I, Amazon is a, uh, we've heard of Amazon. Oh, okay, as I take the long way. Amazon is a company that a lot of us don't think, I, I can do it. But, you're, you know, he's helpful, but I, I'm going to do my, you know. I'll ask my Amazon question later. Rick Lee, ICS. Uh, I like what you said about customer service being the new marketing. And as a follow-up to that, the biggest challenge that I see is when you're dealing with customer service, what role do you see them playing in educating the client or the consumer? I'm from D.C., and we had a, a model. This was back in the 90s. I don't want to date myself. But it said <laughs> uh, the educated consumer is our best client. And so how do you see the role of customer service educating your customers and your clients? Great question. Um, how do you see the role of customer service uh, uh, professionals educating the consumer? I think the role is a shared responsibility, honestly, um, because now there are ways you can educate the customer not just through the help of a customer service individual, but what, n what content you share, what knowledge you share. Self-service, by the way, it, you know, still is, is the place where you want to drive people to, right? There are you know, Apple is a, a brand all of us uh, live by on a daily basis. Um, but it's a brand that they've built around a self-service, peer-to-peer uh, service community paradigm. And there, they've managed to, if you will, educate the world some, uh, to, to some extent, or to a large extent, about their products uh, without necessarily individuals walking people through their devices. Uh, yes, they have a nice service mindset when you walk into a store, but the stores are very few, far and few in between. So. I, I completely agree that you have to think about education, but it's not, I, I, I think it's more than just walking people through something. You know, there's technologies, by the way, you know, screen sharing or co-browsing that allows you to walk people through. But if you're talking about you know, even beyond um, an issue uh, uh, when you come in contact with a customer, you know, there's ways to push content to customers, there's ways to share content, there's ways to drive customers to you know, self-service through any, by the way, device, again, should be done on mobile even more effectively than it is being done today. Um, Google is, a, is another example. Google has worked a web scale business for advertising, and you never talk to a human being. And actually, recently, we hosted at, in San Francisco in one of our events at Fresh Desk, uh, the head of Google Customer Experience. And what Mike was sharing with us was that they have done a lot of, um, and again, Google can afford to do this, they have done some experiments uh, on, uh, on, on sort of engaging with customers and making sure what content works with them. And over time, even without employing people in the line of the conversation through just self-service content, through just putting good tutorials um, and do, making use of service, they've managed to build a set of uh, responses that are pretty accurate. There's also machine learning that goes you know, in the process of that. So yes, the role is there, but I think it, I wouldn't want to simplify that, that, that. What that means is that you know, your service reps spend a lot of their time w educating people through, but rather you have to make use of content. And let me also say this, not just reactive content, it's also proactive content. We know enough about our customers that we can push out certain things and say, hey, by the way, you know, here are a few stories. And again, and especially in a B2B world, that could actually uh, make a difference as well. I hope I answered your question. Chuck Carey, Revenue Sphere. Um, what do you see going forward in the area of um, telephone response? In other words, one of the things that I hate and I know that I've heard from a lot of consumers is they call up someone and they have to go through this telephone click through, click through, click through to, to, before they can even talk to anybody. And it's really, really frustrating. Do you see a, a trend going back to more human intervention? It's a great question, Chuck. And, I, and uh, let me respond a couple of things. Obviously, all of us have had frustrations with that 
um, the way that's managed. So two things are happening. One, uh, by the way, telephone is still, phone is still a primary channel. Yes, on, on, on average, there is more shift towards uh, more interactive channels, that's a chat um, and self-service versus phone and email, but phone is still you know, a key channel. So it's not going away probably in our lifetime anytime soon. However, uh, there is some hope. Um, it's not just the, I mean, we are relying today on IVR technology, you know, you press one and two, and then, you know, you may still talk to somebody who says, oh, by the way, I'm the wrong person, or I don't know enough about it. The good news is uh, technologies such as machine learning is gonna play a role in this. So we, for example, recently acquired a company which will allow us to, um, to look at the transcript uh, data, uh, to look at the email text between our customers and us, and be able to, based on that text, point to the right person within our organization who knows something more about a certain topic than someone else. So now we have the ability as an industry, and that's true, by the way, also of, of phone-based mediums, that if you have transcripts, you know that, let's say, at scale companies that have had thousands of calls coming daily, and there is one individual who has done a great job taking care of, uh, you know, uh, issues like uh, shipping charges that were overcharged or took care of that, you can point to those individuals. You can, by the way, also point to uh, peer uh, sh uh, customers who can help you with a certain, sometimes you can probably get your question answered uh, from a fellow customer better, and, and Amazon does that to some extent. So there is the new trend in the industry that while you know, I'm sure the IVR tech will get better, but machine learning offers a promise that you can, as opposed to a clunky, predetermined, we hired these 10 people, we trained them for these things, and let's let them you know, take care of these topics. In a more fluid manner, if you see that there are certain folks who are better suited or are more experts in a certain topic, you route the calls to them. And I don't know who else is doing it yet, but we expect that to uh, be put in place in contact centers pretty soon. Um, and so that's just one, one example I have where, you know, from our vantage point, uh, from what we are doing, that will happen. So just so you know, by the way, Freshdesk, we also have a phone channel. So, you know, it's multi-channel, so folks can reach, reach out to companies that are using Freshdesk and also use a phone. And we're going to be able to uh, deploy some of the machine learning that we're talking about to our voice transcripts as well. Yes. Uh, absolutely, and that's why, that's precisely why uh, that channel is clunky for the new world, and it's not gonna work in some cases. That's why these things are shifting towards live chat. You know, you say, I don't have time for this. I just wanna go message back and forth. So, but I was just responding to that even as the shift is happening, some companies won't let go of phone, but the phone itself will get better. But the reality is, you're absolutely correct. People are frustrated, we all are frustrated, and that's why live chat is one of the fastest growing channel. Um, everybody wants to have near-term communication. And I was giving you an extreme example that even in the case of Uber, which is built for the new world, it still doesn't have an interactive channel, right? So we have to go a long ways, but we do know, for example, in our business, we have 50,000 customers north of that, well north of that, but um, the, the live chat medium is the fastest growing medium across all our channels. Uh, because people don't wanna deal, and by the way, often we don't wanna deal with another sort of conversation. We just wanna, while we're on the go, get something going. And, but even in case of chat, you have to be able to route it to the right person. So that problem doesn't go away necessarily, right? So that's why I was saying there is a better way to now in a more scientific manner, using the conversations that have taken place, and there's a ton of this data and unstructured text that now we have technology that allows us to say, you know what, we do know this, these couple of individuals have been really good at taking care of this stuff. We're gonna route you to them. And by the way, there's also a fellow customer in your area who dealt with the same issue three months ago. Maybe you can also have a chat in, a, in a, an anonymous manner. All those technologies are available today. And um, you know, we are gonna roll them out in our product over the next few months, but I think uh, you'll see hopefully other companies doing the same. Um, Travis Colley at Core Systems. 
Um, is customer service really considered answering one question or one touch, or is it more of predicting what future problems can come up, and how far does that engagement have to go, or would you consider it too much engagement to the point where, okay, you answered my question, but you're trying to do too much, versus, okay, this is useful information, and you answered my question. Could you elaborate what do you mean by too much? Too far down the line. Like, if it's getting to a point where the problem hasn't come up yet and it's not foreseeable, um, but you keep pushing, like, this may come up, even though it hasn't, but it may, and you keep saying it may, but that it hasn't. That would be a great problem to have <laughs> for us as consumers. Um, okay, it's a pretty broad question. I, I, well, first of all, yes, there is a shift. There's a move definitely towards more predictive versus reactive. And again, we, are, we expect that as consumers. Like, you know, we, we, we all know intuitively that you know enough about me to be able to proactively push stuff to me. Um, but would we get tired of that? Probably not. The good news about when you push things proactively, it's at your, it's on demand. Nobody's, it's, if it's not invasive, if it's coming through an email, or if it's coming through um, a medium that doesn't force you to pick up a phone, you don't mind. So I don't, I don't know if, if that would be an issue, but f definitely, for sure, things are moving in a much more predictive manner because you know so much about customers. Um, I mean, you also know, if, for example, if I have shopped something from, let's say, Brooks Brothers, um, as an example, last three times, and I have had an issue or two, maybe they, ha do, do they know enough about me now to say, hey, by the way, you know, for this time, for your shipping or for your return, here is a, we, are, we are reviewing the, uh, our return policy for you, just so you know what it is. I mean, this is something that's doable today. Companies don't do it because the culture doesn't exist there. They think they have a brand that goes back to uh, two centuries and I'm going to be sticking to it. Maybe not. Um, uh, so so it, it, is, it is not that technology holds us back. It's that, frankly, our mindset holds us back. Um, and we need to quickly overcome that, both for larger companies but also for, for, for smaller brands. Um, but, you know, the good news is if you don't like something that's being pushed, you can always say no. And that's where you want to give customer the empowerment to turn off some notifications, to turn off some responses if it gets too much. But I would rather still take that too much help than, uh, than you know, not getting responded to. Let's wrap up. And I want to get your uh, last thoughts about what should we be on the lookout for uh, in terms of customer expectation, ex expectations being met with technology? What is the channel, the upcoming channel, that may not be that relevant right now, but you see in the next year or so that we're definitely gonna have to be aware of because that's where customers are going. I think overall short form communication, whether it's text, whether it's messaging, is just has to become our, if you just look at our daily lives, we are constantly communicating with our loved ones, uh, actually mo sometimes even more than text and the phone. People don't pick up the phone anymore. Like, including my kids. Like, they, they would prefer to have this text. These are the consumers of today and future. And, and to your point, they're not going to go on a phone and spend 30 minutes getting to the right person. And if you ask how many of us have ever been served by any brand, any company via text, probably hardly any. I just get a text from AT&T saying, oh, you're a new plan, but I'm afraid to respond and say, I have a question because I'm afraid something will break. There's this fear. Well, our children, if you will, they, they, are gonna, they are coming to the world without that fear. They would expect, they already expect, that I need to be able to have that conversation. So I would say text, I would say chat, I would say messaging apps. As many of you know, I mean, WhatsApp, I'm sure some of you use, or many of you use, you know, it's a US phenomena, but you go out to the US, WeChat is, is, raised, is, is, a, is a rage in China, Hike is a rage in India, Billions of people are communicating every single day via those messaging apps on any device. They expect all of the conversation happening with their brands, with their dry cleaner shop, with their restaurant, with their airline, with their university, with their mom, with their dad, on that device in that short form, real time communication, uh, interactive uh, uh, form factor. That, what we deal with today, it's not going to work. So I would say, if you're building a product, if you're rolling out a service uh, um, organization, let's please think about uh, making sure we are ready for that world that is running into us as we speak. Last year, Gartner put out a data which said that 2015 was the first year 
where mobile as where the uh, support queries are originating took over the web-based or phone for the first time. So people are more people are reaching out to brands via mobile device, either a message or a, or a text or, a, or, or an email from their device. And are we ready on the other, hand, on the other side? We, we are not, right? And we need to get quickly. So short answer is text. Uh, short answer is uh, you know, web chat uh, via the mobile device um, in the app experience. Thank you very much. This Thank is you. great. Give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. Absolutely. Sure. That's, That's good stuff. Yeah.